Amen, amen. And didn't he? Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you today. Uh, just came back, as we said earlier, from the marriage retreat. It went fantastic. Those who are going on the second week, you have some great things to look forward to. It was a great time in the Lord. What a blessing, what a blessed time it was together. We still got a room or two if you'd like to come. Some things have happened. Open up, always an open up a cabin or two or three. So it's not too late to embrace this moment and come on and be a part of it. You will not regret it. Amen. How many of those in, in this group here today were at the marriage retreat this weekend? Was it worth coming to? Yeah. There you go. All right. So come on out and be a part of it. It's a great time in the Lord. It's always beautiful this time of the year in the hill country as well. In fact, I think it was cooler here than it was up there, wasn't it? So uh, y'all can keep this cool stuff. I like the warm air better. Next Sunday, I'm going to be getting a new series of messages. Against All Odds is the one we're finishing today. This is the last in the sermon series. But next Sunday, I'm, let me just say this about it. It is probably, <clears throat> I think, one of the most, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Probably one of the most important sermon series I will have preached all year long. And I mean that because of the, the context of it. We can deal with a lot of subjects and a lot of topics and go through the scriptures and, you know, just go line on line, verse on verse. And we do that many times, sometimes we do topical. We're going to start a topical study and it'll be, it'll be also shared in as lift curriculum with our lift leaders. And they'll be taking it and taking another step in the lift groups themselves. And the topic's on prayer. And I say that, uh, that it's probably the most important one we've done all year because uh, very few people realize the, the, the primacy or the priority of prayer. And just where it is in the, in the Christian life and the importance that it plays in the Christian life. And usually you can tell how very few people understand it because very few people pray. But if we really understood prayer and if we'd really learn how to pray, it, it, it is the one thing that transforms our lives. It transforms our situation. It, things happen that would not normally happen. Things happen that are not in the realm of even the natural happening. It's supernatural. God, we experience God on a level, uh, a, a just unique level, uh, like at no other times in our Christian walk in life. Prayer is so vital to the church. And I believe as we all sit around and we watch the news and we watch what goes on in the culture around us, we're seeing everything deteriorate so quickly and rapidly around us that that should bring us to our knees to realize this is the day of prayer. This is the time the people of God should be praying. This is the time to, to, to make a difference in the world. So we're going to talk about a lot about praying. The very first lift group we'll deal with, uh, it'll, it'll kind of review the sermon itself. And then we're going to talk about the, uh, the simple steps to have a, if you're not or don't have a prayer time, how to, how to get started even. We, we'll be dealing with that as well. So uh, lift leaders have already gotten their materials for these first messages and study guides and things. And so uh, if you haven't, it's in your box. All right. If you should have got it by email, if not already. But it will it will hopefully uh, generate some enthusiasm in the group and also a, a new heart and a new passion for fellowship with God and communication with God to spend time with God in prayer. Amen. Now, uh, I, I'm, I'm of, the, of the mindset that uh, that God moves in spite of our situations when we pray. So let's learn how to pray. And then, then after we learn how to pray, let, let us pray. This is, as I said, the last in the series. I've kind of noticed as we've gone through this, the way the Lord has led me in the process is not due to my great brilliance. You know, most things I, I, I find usefulness in are accidental. So it's God's grace. But in the context of these series of messages, if you follow through six, seven, where we're at now in this order of messages that each time we've looked at against all odds, it just gets worse. You know, you think when it can't get worse and we present a sermon where the scenario is worse than the last one. You say, how can it get worse than Daniel losing his friends and they're ready to kill him? He's lost his life, his family and his goods and everything. It can get worse. Then we, we go to, you know, Shadrach, Meshach and the fire. I mean, Daniel had to get in a, David didn't have to go in a fire, did he? But Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego had to go through the fire and their faith is tested. Yeah, it can get worse. Last week was Bartimaeus. I mean, can it get worse than being blind beggar outside town? Nobody cares about it. When Jesus is coming, you try to raise your voice. Everybody trying to tell you, shut up. Yeah, no time for you. He didn't have time for you. You're too big a mess. It gets worse. And today, this message we call tri Tragic tri Triumphant out of 2 Kings is a story about it gets worse. But the lesson in every one of these is, listen carefully, 
No matter how bad it looks, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how desperate and dark the situation may seem in your life, God's bigger than all that. God's bigger than all that. And the lesson I think that we lose in the Christian world and especially in the modern day and our culture of technology and modernism and having things instantaneously and bailing ourselves out with credit cards or whatever it might be, we lose the fact that God's still on the throne and he still does move on behalf of his people and meets their needs and God is still a sovereign God who rules over all things and can and will display himself supernaturally supernaturally, beyond the norm of, of normal events. Too many of us, when we get in our situations and our dilemmas, where, boy, the mind starts working. I can get us out of this, or I can get us through this, and I'm no, I got a plan, I got a plan. Don't worry about it. We'll get the, uh, hey, sometimes you're gonna be like these guys here we'll talk about today. Hey, man, it, we're sunk. <laughs> you know, we're gonna die. Now it's a matter of where we wanna die. And so let's look at the story, and it's a time of famine, and it's a time of great disaster, and it's a time where the enemies are out at the gates, kind of knocking on the doors, waiting for the right opportunity to come in and take whatever's left, and famine fills the land, and nobody has bread, and nobody has food, and nobody has water. They've been eating all the livestock, the horses. In fact, in this story, things have gotten so bad, they only have four horses available to the whole, to the whole kingdom, to the king. They've eaten everything. It's looking pretty rough. Hey, maybe I'll be talking about the four horses. I don't know. <laughs> Discovering what their discussion is here. But the idea is these guys are, uh, it's, at the, it's, it's in the rope. Like last week with Bartimaeus, at least somebody could give him something. He was a beggar. There's nobody to give, him, give these guys anything. So let's look at these, these verses that are laid out here in, in 2 Kings chapter 7. There were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. And they said one to another. This is a great conversation. Why, why do we sit here till we die? If we say we'll enter the city, then the famine's in the city, and we'll die there. If we sit here, we'll die also here. Now, therefore, let us go over to the camp of the Arameans. These are not the good guys, all right? If they spare us, we will live, and if they kill us, man, we just die. So they rose at the twilight to go to the camp of the Arameans, and when they came to the outskirts of the camp of the Arameans, behold, there was no one there. It goes on to say the reason why there's no one there. The Lord had caused the army of the Arameans to hear a sound of chariots and a sound of horses, even the sound of the great army. So they said to one another, behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. They figured that it's a trick. Therefore they arose and they fled in the twilight. They left their tents, their horses, their donkeys, even the camp, just as it was, and they fled for their life. Verse 8, and when these lepers, when they came to the outskirts of the camp, they entered one tent and they ate and drank, and they carried from their silver and gold and clothes, and they went and hid them. And they returned and entered another tent and carried them from there also, and they went and hid them. Verse 9, then they said to one another, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news, but we are keeping silent. If we wait until morning light, punishment, mischief will overtake us, is the word here. Therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. We're not doing good. We've got to go tell somebody about this, this bountiful blessing that's just outside the, the city gates, just beyond it, just a little bit that we've discovered here. Now, I have this sermon broke down into six simple points. And they pretty much sent around these men, their situation, their reaction. Obviously, we said already they were leprous men. So these, these are despised men. They're not men like we talked about with Bartimaeus. You know, they can tolerate Bartimaeus. He kind of comes and goes. Bartimaeus most likely has some family members who, who help him to the city's edge where the beggars sit and takes him home. In some way, he makes it through and he's getting by. These guys are at the city gates, and, and they, what I say is that it goes beyond it because these are lepers, all right? These are the worst of the worst of the worst for the outcasts. They, they're not allowed into the city gates for the most part without special permission. And when they go into the city gates, they have to be fully covered, and they can't touch anyone, and they have to go down the highway and the byway of the city saying, unclean, unclean unclean <coughs> that doesn't those guys wouldn't do well in our culture you know they wouldn't do well we, we don't we don't want anybody to see our imperfections 
We don't want anybody to draw attention to our imperfections. Yet at the same time, we're so self-absorbed with ourselves, we're sitting around taking selfies all the time. But we've discovered that there's not only an app for doing selfies, you can fix them. You can Photoshop them. You can get rid of that pimple. You brush right over it. You know, that, but can you imagine being in that kind of culture and scenario where you have to draw attention to your, to your problem? Unclean, unclean. So the people, you know, they, they see these guys coming, they're young and clean, man, they're stepping out of the way. I don't have anything to do with that guy. I don't want to touch him. I don't want to be around. Don't breathe on me. I don't want to be around you. So, you, know, you see, it's a little worse even than where Bartimaeus was. It's, it's worse. They're covered with rags and filthy rags and, you know, they, they, they'd wrap themselves with these linen cloths and, of course, the pus and, you know, th this, I won't get into much. I don't want to get sick, but it's nasty, you know. In fact, leprosy is a great picture symbolically of sin because the way that leprosy works, it just needs a little place to start and then it starts consuming radically consuming your life. It doesn't take a lot of sin to get you in to a big mess to wreck your life. And it's never satisfied. You can't say, well, that was enough sin. No, it's not. It's always appealing. It's always dragging you down. It wants more. It demands more. It requires more. And it only brings about misery and death and pain. These guys, in fact, when Paul talked about, you know, that our, that our righteousness, our very best without Jesus in our life, he says it is like filthy rags. That would be the rags that the lepers would be taken off their sores, filled with blood and pus and, you know, infection. Paul said, hold that thing up. That's your best and you compare yourself with God. You think you're so good, you think you're so righteous, you think you're right, hey, look at that. You're a mess. And the problem is we're not willing to see that many times. So the lepers, you know, there's a lot of things we could draw into this message, how that represents our own sin, our own failure, our total inability, you know. And, and most people never get to the place to realize that, and that's why most people live in miserable lives. They're just getting by. They're just kind of sustaining. They're like these lepers, you know. We're just going to sit here till we die? Unless you do something, yes. Unless you make some choices, yes. Unless you make some decisions, yes. Unless repentance comes into your heart as far as your relationship with God. You're just going to die. And you're going to be miserable in your life. And then it's going to be miserable after your life because you'll die and you'll go to hell. And that's even worse, amen? These guys are in bad shape physically spiritually, and, it's just, it's, and, and here's the deal about it, in, in their desperation, something begins to, you know, click inside, you know? And, and it's not that perhaps no one wanted to help. Maybe like with Bartimaeus, you could throw him a few shekels. No one could help. No one could help the situation. I, I don't know if you've ever been there in your life. I, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever scaled that particular mountain where it just seems that I'm in a mess. And there's no help. Nobody can heal this situation. Nobody can help this problem. I think about that shooter in Oregon, you know, or the other guys at Columbine. And they all kind of fit that same scenario of miserable young men. And that where else are they going? They're going to go out and be miserable and make everybody else miserable. And they think the whole world's about their misery, so they're going to make everybody else miserable. I appreciate that the sheriff in Oregon said, we are not going to say his name. It's written here. We're not going to give this guy any credit. He deserves nothing. We're not going to give him any glory. He deserves nothing. You know? Well, you know, bless his heart. No, his heart doesn't need to be blessed. He needs to be saved is what needs to happen. He needs to have an encounter with God. He needs to quit looking to the world for attention and for people for satisfaction and for Vince to change in his life to make his life better. It's time for him to do something right, not wrong. And so many people, are, you know, they might not go to those extremes in their life, but yet they still won't do the right thing. And they, they, they feel this, this kind of strange world collapsing in on them. There is hope. Don't ever get that point like that guy where you think there's no hope. There's hope in Jesus Christ. There's hope in pursuing Christ. These guys were, they were in a position, that if anybody's despised in the culture, they were. But here's what happens. They, in this, this despised position, Something happens and something begins to click inside. They, they get desperate. And you just you kind of, you can kind of see these guys, are, they're sitting there leaning against the wall talking, you know. Maybe they're sitting down, maybe they're cross leg. I don't know, but they're, they're hungry, I can tell you that much. One guy looks at us and says, we just gonna sit here till we die? 
And another guy said, well, we can go in the city. What's going to happen? Nobody's going to help us there. We're just going to die there. He said, well, what if we go to the camp of the Aramaeans? That's the enemy. Well, they may have mercy on us. They may feel sorry for us. And the worst they can do is kill us. So we just die. So one way or the other, we're going to die. <laughs> so there might be some opportunity here if we get up, move out of our depression, move out of our despair, move out of our misery, and just go against all odds. We have nothing to lose. Let me tell every one of us in this room, no matter how blessed you are and how well off you are and how good things might be going for you in your life right now, as well as the person who thinks everything seems to be falling apart and doesn't look like there's any hope, without a heartfelt, heart, real commitment to God in our lives and to His Son, Jesus Christ, we are hopeless. And I'm not just saying that because that just sounds kind of spiritual. No, this is what Jesus said. He looked at those disciples of his and he said to them, without me, you're nothing. Now that sounds arrogant, doesn't it? On one hand, <laughs> without me. No, he's the son of God, God himself in the flesh. And he is trying to let poor fallen human humanity bound in its sin and its misery to know there's an answer to being something. And it's not going to come through money and it's not going to come through marriage and it's not going to come through relationships and it's not going to come through, you know, climbing the cultural ladder. It's going to come through a, a knowing and a welcoming and a walking with me. Amen. That's where your life begins. That's where life starts for all of us when we come to know Jesus. Well, these guys are desperate. They're, well, there's no other thing. They realize there's nothing to lose. And they said, let's just risk our lives. But isn't that the same call to Christ? Give me your life. Give me your life. Too many people think the call to Christ is join the church. Pray a prayer. Read your Bible. Give a little money. And be nice and obey the golden rule. That is not Christianity. I don't know where you got that. Well, I, I do. There's a lot of churches who preach that. But that's not the Bible, all right? The Bible, here's the call. Come, die so you can live. Risk it all. Lay it all down. Headlong, throw yourself at it. Give it all to Jesus. That's where these guys are at. There's no other resolution. We, we don't have anything to lose. We don't have anything to offer. We don't have anything to give. Some of you think if you come to Jesus, it's God's, you're God's gift to the kingdom. You know, well, God's so blessed to have me in the kingdom. Bless the Lord. What a mess. Don't we make ourselves a mess? Just let arrogance in our life and pride get in our heart and pride get in our life. And it, it, here they are, they got in a, I think this is what, 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 when Isaiah, and he's a church member, all right? He's a prophet of God, let's put it that way. When Isaiah gets desperate before God and he, he says, I, you know, woe is me, I am undone. Those are his words. I like what Bill Stafford said, he's undone, that means you're half-baked. <laughs> I didn't get you credit for being half-baked. <laughs> We're about a quarter baked, maybe. I'm undone. I'm a mess. My life's empty. But you're a prophet of God. God's hands on your life. God speaks to you. But my heart is cold. And my heart is cold because what comes out my mouth, he said, man, I'm a man with a dirty mouth. He wasn't talking about profanity, I don't think. I just think, you know, and we can usually tell where our heart's at by what comes out our mouth, right? We usually gauge the measure of our spirituality by how we speak. Woe is me. Same thing with Job, the same thing with, with Paul on the road to Damascus. On down the, the line, you see desperation in people's life. And that desperation is, is not something we should be afraid of. It's a desperation that leads ultimately to a revelation. There's an opening moment here. You know, well, we, there's nothing else to try. You can do this. What is this? It's come to God. Throw it all on the line. Throw, it all, throw your whole life out there. Here I am, God. You don't do something in my life, I'm a mess. That's the way I came to Christ. That's why I came to Jesus. Every relationship had gone bad. Every job had gone bad. Every situation had gone bad. There was only two things that I could count on in my life, and that was finding a cold beer somewhere and a joint to smoke. And I was running out of money, so you knew how it wasn't gonna last long. That was breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Miserable life, isn't it? Miserable existence. And that may not be, it may be, I just get up and go to work. Got a job. 
Yeah. No abundance, no joy, no victory, no peace, no purpose, no passion, nothing to be zealous about and, you know, on fire about, nothing to be committed to. Get desperate in your life. Have a desperation in your life that says, there's got to be more. And I think it comes even in our Christian life. There's got to be more in my Christianity than just going through the motions. Amen? Just going through the actions of everything. Well, Father Joe, I don't have anything to offer. Good. Because anything you offer isn't good enough anyway. Those are filthy rags. So follow the story here. They're despised men. They become desperate men in, this, in, in their situation. And out of that desperation, it leads them to a determination. Verse 5 says, so they rose up at twilight. They got up off their so-called blessed assurance. and said, no sense sitting here any longer. We're just going to die right here. And I'm amazed at how long people will stay in that position. I really am. You know, I'm amazed how long I stayed in that position. You know, so I, I can't blame anybody else. We can all be that way. We can all be stubborn. We can all really think. Here's what I think where it kind of goes. Well, maybe I can really find life without Jesus. Maybe I can really find fullness without abandonment of my life to Jesus. Maybe, maybe I can really kind of do some Jesus stuff and get by. I really don't have to... Follow him. Listen, if your Christianity doesn't include what Jesus said Christianity is, you didn't get Christianity. You say, what did Jesus say? It was Jesus said you deny yourself, you take up the cross, and you follow him. So if there's no denial of yourself in life, no taking up the cross of Christ, dying to yourself daily, and following Jesus, then I might check my Christianity. But Brother Joe, I know I'm saved. How? Well, I was baptized. You baptized me. That didn't work, did it? Didn't take. <laughs> It's not baptism doesn't save you. Well, Brother Joe, uh, you led me in a prayer. Wonderful. Did you pray it? Every word you prayed, I prayed. Okay. Did you believe it in your heart? Did you live it out, not just from your lips, but with your life? Well, not really. But I went to the new members class. By the way, it's just in a couple of weeks. <laughs> I went to the members class. 101, I was there. You can look at the records. But you know, the very first thing we did with our one-on-one class, that little bit that we started with, was about your salvation and clarifying that. Because no sense being a member of church till you remember Jesus. Yes. Yes. Right? Well, I don't remember that part. <laughs> Where's Christ in your life? Is there any pursuit of Jesus? Don't give me, well, you know I want to. Not if you're sitting there at the city gate on your blessed assurance, as we said, you don't want to yet. You're not desperate enough yet. I was just getting way too quiet. I guess I'll look at my notes. <laughs> What'd you do? I decided it had to be something better. You know, and I just didn't care anymore. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care what anybody does. I want to get saved. And there's been times in my life I've had to say the same thing again. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care what anybody says. I've got to get right with God in this area of my life. I've got to move on with God. I don't care what anybody, I don't care if they talk about me. Hallelujah. It just, it just doesn't matter. The problem is, and men are the worst. This. Women do it too, but the men are, I think, even more. Worse. We think we can always come up with a plan B. Until you realize there is no plan B, C, D, A, or whatever, then you're not going to find this fullness that God has for your life. They just got desperate, you know, and they said, hey, we're going to sit here or we're going to die. And I believe true desperation always leads to true determination here. Will you make the move, that step of faith that God wants you to make, the, the step of faith that says, I'm not just going to say yes to something. I'm all in. Y'all know what it means to be all in, don't you? You, you? Just that last poker chip that you've been holding on to, that last little issue in your life, you know, just shove it out there and say, God, it's yours. That's when God starts doing something supernatural. That's when the things you can't explain begin to happen. That's when that question I had before I came to Christ was something like this. How do I know it worked? It'll work when you get all in. God's committed to you. This is where it led to. It led to their deliverance. It says these were delivered men. Ultimately say they were delivered and delighted. Amen. They were excited about what God. Catch what happens. Now this, this is great. Verse 7 it talks about how, how the, you know, that the Aramaeans at twilight. All right. says that at the twilight they'd heard this great noise. And they thought it was the Egyptians and the Hittites that had been hired by the, by the Israelis to come in and take care of their, their, their military problem. 
because they weren't able to do it, so they just paid somebody to come and take care of it. And this noise happened, and this thunderous sound happened, so they just knew an army was approaching, and they ran for absolute fear into the dark of night. Now, here's, what's, here's what, you know, this is the way the Word of God is. It's so strategic, and it's so unique, and it's so specific. It says in, in, in that early verse that when the, they got up, it says, so at twilight, the four lepers arose. All right, this is over at the city gate. Let's go a few miles down the road here where the air man's camped at, you know, meanwhile back at the ranch. At the very same time that these guys stand up, over here something happens because it says in verse seven, at twilight. Now that's not a coincidence. All right. Oh, you Christians you like to take coincidence. No, not a coincidence. It's a God incidence. God does something. When? At twilight. At the same time. Y'all know what twilight is, right? If you looked up in the Webster's Dictionary, it says something like this. The definition for twilight. It's a noun. Which means that moment just as the sun leaves the horizon of soft, diffused light. <laughs> right before the dark. And I'm thinking, these guys think, hey, if we're going to do anything... We better do it right now because the sun's going down. You need to be careful, folks, because maybe in your life the sun's going down. There's only a little light left to respond to. It's time to respond to it. And what happens in the moment of their faith to get up, move out? against all odds, against all the unknowns, against, well, what about this and what about that? And I heard somebody say this about God and what about that and what about creation and what about evolution and what about people who never hear the gospel? Just junk all that. Amen. The Bible says, he who comes to God must believe that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That he is and that he's the rewarder, but also said, hey, that he's the creator of all things. In other words, if he can take care of that, he'll take care of your questions. You move out on the light you got. You step out in the light God gives you. And what happens, again, this is that moment. This is, this is, I'd do my happy dance if it wouldn't offend you, all right? But <laughs> ask Kathy, I have a happy dance, don't I? I got several, don't I? She's always afraid I'll bust one right in front of you guys. So I, I always try not to, so as not to embarrass her too bad. My kids know my happy dances, all right? Just, just, just break it out, hallelujah, this is fun, this is great. Because that same God who did that has not died. Amen. He's not dead. I know some of you are getting like old as I am and you forget a lot of stuff. You say, well, God's real old. He not near that old. He forgets nothing. Nothing escapes him in your situation. Nothing escapes him what's going on in your life. Nothing escapes him what's going on in your heart. Nothing escapes him. He's waiting for you to stand up, move out on the light that you've been given and respond to that and see what he'll do. It doesn't matter if it looks like there's no hope and it's almost dark, it's almost gone. There's no, there's no way. We'll just let the sun go down and we'll just all die. <laughs> Not so with God. Not so with God. Uh, this, this is... This is this is such an important part of this message, you know. It's great to be saved, all right? But it's greater to know God, to have God, to realize that he's there. It's one thing to have, be delivered from something, all right? And people get delivered from stuff all the time, even in the physical sense, you know. Uh, it's like my, my brother who, y'all remember his heart issue when he was dead for all that time and they kept working on him, working on him, and finally, you know, the doctors put him in a room to die and God just raised him up from the dead, basically, you know. They unplugged everything, took all the medicine out, and, you know, 20, within 12 hours, I think he was awake of what was going on. It, you know, it's great when we see that deliverance. A year later, after that, which is now about a year and six months into it, a year after that happened, he went back to the fire station to meet the guys who'd worked on him all that time. All right? To meet his rescuers. Now, a lot of times we get rescued, and, and you know, we never meet the rescuer. <laughs> you know? I, I, this is a story I hear a lot of times. People, well, you know, I was in the war and I should have died, but I didn't. God must have saved me for something. Well, duh, yeah. <laughs> but he didn't save you to sit around and talk about how he saved you, so it must have been for something, and you're 80 years old and hadn't discovered this something. Yeah. Come on. 
The something is God wants you to meet the deliverer. He wants you to know the rescuer. To, to experience that in your life, that's the greatest deliverance of all. Is now that something supernatural happened and you're not wondering why. You know why. The why was to meet the one who delivered you. Now, let, let's move on because you're taking way too long with that. Number five, they were deceived men. You say, what do you mean? It says here, uh, they, they went into the tent. They found what they found. They carried it out. They ate, they drank, they carried out silver, gold clothing. They took it and, and they went and hid it. I mean, you can almost see these guys, right? They come to the edge of the camp and nobody's there. It's kind of like, hello? 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 One turns and says, the lights are on. One says, nobody's home. What's going on? There? Hello? Kind of creeping, looking under the tent flaps. Nobody's in there. Another tent flap. Nobody's in here. And all of a sudden hits him. Oh, man. There's food. There's drink. There's some clothing. There's silver. There's gold. Man, we have hit the mother load. I imagine they ate till they were sick. Especially if you haven't eaten in a while. It's easy to do. And then you see them gathering stuff up. Take this, take this, take this, take this. Get some of that, get some of that. And, they're get, and you can see it piled around their shoulders and stuffed out of their pockets and holding on as much as they can. And there they are. What are we going to do with this? Let's go hide it. Yeah! <laughs> they run up and they, they hide it. Where? I don't know, out in the bushes. And they'll be hidden when the sun comes up. They come back. Let's do another one. And they do it all again. <laughs> hiding it, cover it up. That is the picture of the church in the Western Hemisphere. I'll just be more specific. That's the picture of people sitting in this room. That's what I thought you said. Isn't it? Let me get my breath. Don't work on me too hard. See, you ought to go to the marriage retreat. This does that wonders for you. Anyway, finally, after several tents, several armloads, they're puffing and panting. And one says, in fact, it says they all said, this ain't right. This ain't right. Took them a bit, but they caught on. We do not write in a SB says, King James says, we do not well. The true word in the Hebrew language, and come here if you have your Hebrew Bible there, you can tell me if it's true. It is the word true. We're not being true. We're not true. If anything a Christian ought to be, it's true. We love Jesus. You get what you see, you see what you get. We're true to Jesus. We're true to his word. The Bible says God's word in multiple places in Psalms is, and his word is true. All his commandments are true. All his judgments are just and true. Same word. We're not being true. What are we being? Well, anytime we're gathering a bunch of stuff up and hiding it and keeping it for ourselves, we're not true. Anytime we're taking an obvious blessing from God and it only involves us, we're not true. Anytime, anytime, when we get to thinking that our Christian life is just about me and what God can do for me, how God can help me, how God can deliver me, how God can bless me, then I'm not being true. God never, and I said that, I think I said it's Marriage Street, God never does something just for you. See what do you mean? If I receive it correctly, then I'll realize it's for me to be blessed with. God loves me. He's committed to me but it's also for someone else. The words of Jesus, the greatest commandment, you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, strength, and you love your neighbor yourself. Well, excuse me, what about me? You're supposed to love God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. But yeah, yeah, but did I get something? What's the reward? Got a scratch off? <laughs> something I can get? 
The reward is him. He's the ultimate reward. And when you take your time to know him, it's amazing what he'll do in your life. If we had one of the testimonies of the marriage retreat, Mike Duke stood up and said that, didn't he, for those who were there. He said, you know, everything's falling apart. Marriages and life fall apart. He said, God just told me I just need to know him. And everything else started coming back together. Because anytime we start moving towards God, it involves those around us. It affects those around us. It impacts those around us. It works in people's lives around us. That's why Paul wrote the Corinthians. He says, you know, my God is sufficient. He'll supply all your needs. But he only knows so when he say he, he'll give you all sufficiency in all things. That's A-L-L, -L, all, all things. God will meet your needs in everything. He'll make it, you'll have sufficiency. But he also gives it to you, not only for you, he says, with enough left over for every good work. In other words, God's blessed me with a blessed income, but it's not just for me. I present first fruits. I, I take care of others. I help people. I minister to people. I use it. I use it. But it, it, it's, it's amazing when he says here, when, when this the moment of discernment comes, they said to one another, this is a day of good tidings. In the New Testament, it would read more like this. This is a gospel day. This is a good news day. This is the day of good tidings. What are tidings? Well, most time, glad tidings, good tidings, we think of words spoken, right? This is, and that's what they're talking about. This is the day we need to say something, to announce something, all right? It literally means, in the Hebrew language, Bessara, which has to do, uh, has to do with a, re comes from a word which means a reward for tidings, a, re a war reward, a blessing that comes with a word, a, a blessing that comes with an, with an announcement, that, that there's a result of something that's being announced. There's an effect to what's being said. And they said, hey, we have a word which can impact people's lives. We have a word which can help people. We have a word which will bless people. We've been blessed with that. Now we need to take this blessing and speak from that blessing what God has done for us. That comes from our gifts. It comes from ultimately our words. It's obvious throughout the New Testament we've been called to speak the glad tidings, speak the good news, speak the word of God. That's the way, that's the, way the word gets out. I sat with some deacons from the Magnolia campus a couple weeks ago in a, in, a, in a meeting, week before last, and one of them said, well, why is the church not grown during the summer like we, we wanted it to see? I said, there's, there's no secret to this. <laughs> well, why didn't it grow? Because you didn't bring anybody. I don't think that was the report they wanted, but that was the report that comes. The church doesn't grow when you don't bring anybody. How many of you sat around and you had lunch over that discussion? You don't raise your hand. Well, I don't think the church is growing. Because you're not bringing anybody. Well, what do you mean? Who'd you bring today? Oh. <laughs> you can't say that to me. I just did. Amen. Who'd you bring today? Who'd you invite this week? You didn't bring anybody. At least you invited them. Amen? You invited them. You know, out on the table, every week there's stacks of these little, we call them invite cards. They're like little table cards you can fold over and leave everywhere you go. You say, well, I don't know how to do that. Hey, I'm going to give you the lesson. Lesson one, open your mouth. Lesson two, speak. Anything works. Like, where do you go to church? Or, do you go to church? Or, anybody ever told you about Jesus? Or, are you a Christian? Or, does God do anything in your life? To, I mean, there's a thousand things can come out. Right? Hello. I know you know how to talk. And that's all it is. Well, I'm, but I'm speaking out of the blessings. I'm not hoarding the blessings. And for us to get so blessed by God, I mean, we are so blessed. We've got great music, great worship, you know, half-decent preacher. I'll, I'll give him that much, you know. And if he's not here, Brother Tim's going to fit the bill, so you know that's good. We've got great Bible study leaders and lift group leaders and people that love Jesus and, and children's ministry and youth ministry. I mean, the word's just popping everywhere around here. But if we don't bring people, invite people, encourage people, put it this way, what's the use? We might as well sit around and scratch each other's back. We do not well. We do not well. That's not my ministry. If you get saved, it is. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5, we're all ministers of reconciliation. That's just spreading good news. I, I, I really think, and this is where we don't discern. I think the problem is we get preoccupied with blessing, don't we? What God's done for us. I mean, we, how the Lord's helped us and what God's done on our behalf and how God took care of the need and how God opened the door and how God healed the sickness and how God took care of this and God gave you the job and God took care. But you never let it pour out. You're like that... 
you know, that, like that sponge. I mean, have you ever got the grease in the skillet real hot and dropped in a tortilla? That size. It's puffed out with hot air. That's what it does. Yeah, right? A little sugar and cinnamon and a little honey on it. We just eat it. <laughs> we just, we just puffed up happy with ourselves, filled with ourselves, full of ourselves. And that's not, that's not why God blessed you. Just be satisfied for yourself. Part of it. That's not, that's, that's not the all of it. Let me just close with a couple of scriptures. Here's what Paul said. If I don't do this, if I don't speak the gospel, well, he's the apostle. He's a Christian. We're all, this all fits us. If I don't do what Jesus told me to do, which he's told every one of us to do, right? I'll put it that way. The last great commandment was go preach the gospel. He says, I don't have anything to glory of. What is he saying? I don't have anything to brag about if I'm not sharing it. Because I'm selfish. He said, I don't have anything to glory of. This is 1 Corinthians 9, 16. He says, for necessity is laid upon me. And I believe every one of us that know Jesus. Woe unto me if I preach, speak, herald, if I don't tell the gospel message. Woe unto me. Well, how could woe come unto you as a Christian? And woe can come unto you like if you're my son or you're my daughter and you don't do what I tell you to do. You're going to have some woe come upon you. <laughs> Amen? Parents know what woe is, right? They say, hey, if we don't do this, some woe is going to come upon us. The Apostle Paul says some woe is going to come upon us. And this, this illustration bears that through all the scriptures, but one of the most, I think one of the most cutting passages of scripture that has broken my heart on more than one occasion is the passage when God is speaking through the prophet Ezekiel in chapter three. And let me just share the words. When I say to the wicked, you will surely die. This is God speaking. When I tell a person he's going to die and go to hell if he, if he doesn't come to me, it's, that's the Joram's translation. Here's the rest of the King James. He's going to die. And thou, if thou givest them not a warning, and nor do you speak us to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that, that wicked man, that same wicked man will die in his iniquity. In other words, if you don't help him, if you don't point him to the truth, he's going to die in his iniquity. That's bad enough. But the rest of it goes on to say, the same wicked, wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. The rest of the verse, if you warn the wicked and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. You have delivered your soul. What's he saying? If a man's living a life apart from God and you don't tell him the truth about Jesus Christ, that guy's going to go to hell. But I will require his blood at your hands because I gave you something and you didn't do anything with it. We do not well. He said, now the same wicked man, if you tell him what I told you to tell him and he doesn't turn his way, that's not your problem anymore. All right? He has a responsibility to respond to the light and to the message he's been given. God help us to realize, do not so be absorbed with getting our stuff out of the air may intense that we don't see the necessity that God's laid upon our lives to be faithful messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now this, this message is the, is the last of against all odds. Some of you are saying, <laughs> But to me, these messages have been extremely encouraging. You know, I, extremely encouraging messages to, to, to wake me up to see that there's a divine, sovereign, supernatural God who wants to work in our lives against all odds. But we also have some faith steps we need to make in every situation. Will I trust God? Will I believe God? And then once I move towards God, will I be faithful to follow what he's spoken to me? God has blessed us all in this room. I don't care how bad things are in your life right now. You be honest, you'll see it's not near as bad as you've seen all around this world. Amen. It's just not, it's one thing about, appreciate about when we take our, our people on mission trips, they see the hardship of life in so many different countries of the world. It brings a new appreciation, doesn't it, for the blessings that we have. But these blessings don't come without responsibilities. Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. And I think it's, it's, it's there's a point where I have to look at myself and say, I've been given a lot. What am I doing with it? You know? 
If I'm the kind of person that's been given a lot and I can't even give an offering, a first fruits offering to the Lord, if I can't even do that, I'm in trouble. If I'm the kind of person who can just enjoy gospel messages and the word of God and your sermons and say, hey man, that's good stuff, and then walk out here and never share that, or invite somebody at least, I'm in a bad place. I pray that God send a revival. I, I, I get to those places just like you do. And God sends a messenger. And God sends a message. And God sends his word. Shakes my heart. I get right. I'm praying that's what happens in your heart. If you, if you fall into this, this, any area of this message today, you'll receive that word and let God do something real and genuine and deep in your heart and life. We serve a mighty God. He's able to shake the mountains all around you. The Bible says, I'll make a highway where there is no highway, right through the mountains. I'll make them flat, and you can walk on them. He still does that in people's lives today. He still does what doesn't, doesn't seem like it's a possibility to be done. He's, he still saves people that seem unsavable. He still changes things. He still heals people. He still does things supernaturally. I serve a supernatural God. He's not dead. He's on his throne. He's still making a difference in the world. And I need to be a difference maker for him in this world and with him. Let's stand with our heads bowed.